Creation and Science. This is a recent book. We've released it, Reasons to Believe. The subtitle is A Testable Model Approach to End the Creation Evolution Wars. The Reasons to Believe ministry is a little over 20 years old right now, uh, but the thing that I have noticed over the past 20 years is that these creation evolution debates have become increasingly more hostile and society is becoming more and more polarized as a result of these debates and it's really the root of the science education crisis. And the basic appeal of creation and science is to lower the hostility through open competition among testable explanations of nature's record. And what is nature's record? The origin and the history of the universe, planet Earth, and life upon that planet. Now, this raises a question. Are creation explanations of nature's record even viable? Are they even legal in American society and society at large? Well, we argue in the book that it is perfectly legal based on four court cases uh, that have rendered decisions on a creation science education. And uh, what the courts did, particularly the 1987 Supreme Court ruling, made the point that the Constitution of the United States guarantees the freedom of religion were not to interpret it as guaranteeing the freedom from religion. This is not the Soviet Union, where no religion is permitted at all. It's the freedom of, not the freedom from. And the intent of the framers of the Constitution in putting that First Amendment in is to prevent a state-run or a state-mandated church or denomination. The concern was that there may be a situation where every American would have to be a Lutheran or have to be a Baptist or a Congregationalist. In fact, when our nation was founded, they did permit the states to have mandated churches, but they said that would not be the case at the federal level. Well, since then, the two states that did have uh, mandated denominations, namely Massachusetts and Maryland, one being Catholic, the other being Congregationalist, have followed the federal suit, and throughout America, there is now the freedom of religion, and we're not to interpret it as a freedom from. Now, one of the most helpful contributions of the 1987 Supreme Court uh, rendering was the fact that they stated that any explanation of the origin and development of the universe or life that shows scientific integrity and credibility can be taught regardless of the theological implications. In other words, the theology behind the explanation is not what matters. What matters is its scientific integrity and credibility. The court rulings affirm that the U.S. Constitution cannot be used to keep good science out nor can it be used to force bad science in. And that's really the reason why Christians lost those four court cases. They were trying to force a bad scientific explanation of the creation record into the public education arena, and the U.S. courts uh, very correctly ruled that that can't be done. On the other hand, they did guarantee that any explanation that did have integrity and credibility was in regardless of the theology. So, for example, Big Bang cosmology, even though it points to the God of the Bible, can't be ruled out since it is based on a sound science. And the courts are really mandating a free market environment for scientific research and education. And this is, one again, one of my passions for writing this book, Creation of Science, is it seems like there are forces on both the evolutionary side and the creation side uh, to try to uh, limit a free market competition amongst explanations of the record of nature. Now with that, I want to review for you the reasons to believe testable creation model. And uh, what we do at Reasons to Believe is we start with the simple sciences, then move step by step to the more complex sciences. And so what I'm going to do for you today is begin with the simple sciences of mathematics, physics, and astronomy, those are the sciences that are so simple uh, that the different objects we're studying uh, obey equations of state and uh, differential equations will help you predict past and future behavior. 
Then we'll move into the more complex sciences where the subject matter is so enormously complex we can't use that kind of mathematics uh, to help uh, frame uh, what's going on. So we're going to begin with cosmology. Now, the first book I ever read on cosmology is when I was seven years of age. It was by the famous British cosmologist Fred Hoyle. And in his book, he stated that the Bible was filled with cosmology. And what the Bible had to say about cosmology was amazing given the time in which it was written. Well, the first time I went through the Bible at age 17, I did note that the Bible stated repeatedly three things about the universe. Namely, that the universe can be traceable back to an ex nihilo beginning. That means an actual beginning uh, of the universe out of nothing, a beginning of space, time, matter, and energy. That the universe continuously expands from that point of beginning, and it expands under constant physics, such that with the universe having fixed physical laws and continuously expanding, this would be a universe uh, that under those laws of physics would get colder and colder as the universe gets older and older. And uh, you know, today we recognize these uh, statements as the three fundamental foundations of Big Bang cosmology. And it's not Albert Einstein that came up with Big Bang cosmology first. It wasn't uh, uh, Wilson and Penzias. Rather, it was Bible authors thousands of years ago uh, who first described these details of the universe. Now, many of you are probably aware of at least a few of the verses in the Bible that talk about this cosmic beginning, how the universe is traceable back to a single beginning in finite time. Probably the most famous of these passages would be Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens of the earth. And in using the word create, the Hebrew word bara, it means to bring something brand new into existence which never existed uh, before. And then you've got Hebrews 11.3 that says that the universe that we can detect was made from that which we cannot detect. And then we have uh, passages I don't have up here uh, by the Apostle Paul which speak about an actual beginning of space and time that's coincident with the creation of the universe. Well, in the 21st century, we now have scientific evidence that what the Bible says about cosmic creation is correct. And this is significant because the other religions of the world speak about God or God's creating within space and time. The Bible uniquely stands alone in talking about a God that creates independent of the matter, energy, space, and time. Now, the first evidence we had for this was published in 1970 in uh, this paper in the Astrophysical Journal. And uh, this is the first of the space-time theorems of general relativity. This is what vaulted Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose uh, to worldwide fame. And in this paper, they point out that if the equations of general relativity reliably describe the dynamics of the universe, and if indeed the universe contains matter, then the entire universe must be traceable back to a beginning and it's a beginning of matter, energy, space, and time. And there's a corollary to this paper which implies that there must be a causal agent beyond space and time that's responsible for bringing into existence uh, this universe. Now, no one questions that the universe contains mass, but when this paper was published uh, back in 1970, we were only able to prove uh, that uh, general relativity reliably described the dynamics of the universe uh, to 1% uh, precision, to two places the decimal. But thanks to discoveries made at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, in the words of Roger Penrose, general relativity now ranks as the most exhaustively tested and best proven principle in all of physics. And some experiments actually demonstrate that general relativity reliably describes cosmic dynamics to better than 14 or 15 places the decimal. In other words, to better than a trillionth of a percent precision. Therefore, there's no basis for doubting this conclusion that if the universe contains mass, and if general relativity reliably describes cosmic dynamics, 
then space and time must be created by a causal agent that transcends space and time. Now, this first paper was the space-time theorem in the context of classical general relativity. What has happened since 1970 is a number of astrophysicists have gone to the next level and tried to develop space-time theorems that take into account not just gravity, but the effect of quantum mechanics. Because in the early history of the universe, uh, the forces of gravity and quantum mechanics become comparable, and therefore there's been a development of several dozen space-time theorems uh, based on different quantum gravity constructs for the universe. And as such today that we have a goodly number of these space-time theorems, and all of them are coming to this conclusion that there indeed must be this ultimate beginning of space and time. So these space-time theorems of general relativity are growing in number and growing in generality, and the theorems are becoming more and more applicable. And to quote a couple of astrophysicists, Ford and Roman, uh, they wrote in their paper that all reasonable cosmic models are subject to the relentless grip of the space-time theorems of general relativity. Now, they were in this paper talking about what they called the unreasonable models. These are models where the second law of thermodynamics does not operate. Uh, that second law tells us that uh, things will tend from order to disorder, and the heat will flow from hot bodies to cold bodies. Now, if you allow that second law to be violated, there are possible ways you can escape this ultimate beginning of matter, energy, space, and time. But we refer to them as unreasonable cosmic models because they will not allow any kind of physical life to exist. And clearly, physical life does exist uh, in the universe. Therefore, all the reasonable models, models that would permit the existence of physical life, indeed are subject uh, to the space-time theorems, which gives us a rigorous proof that there must be a causal agent beyond space and time as responsible for bringing into existence this universe of matter, energy, space, and time. Now, in creationist science, we refer to our reasons to believe creation model as a testable model that is able to make predictions of future scientific discoveries. Let me give you six such discoveries in the context of these space-time theorems. We would predict that the evidence for a single cosmic beginning, as opposed to multiple beginnings, will get stronger as astrophysicists learn more about the universe. That the evidence that time is finite rather than infinite, again, would increase. That evidence for general relativity reliably describing cosmic dynamics uh, will become even more spectacular than it is today. In fact, there's an experiment going on right now, the Gravity B probe, uh, to test the theory of general relativity in one arena where we've only been able to push it to two places, the decimal. Uh, this is the lens thuring effect. It's the weakest of the tests that have been performed so far. But the Gravity B probe uh, will give us 100 to 1,000 times more accuracy in putting general relativity to the tests in that arena. We would predict that general relativity will continue to spectacularly uh, pass those tests. Uh, number four, uh, we would predict that the grip of the space-time theorems of general relativity will become even more relentless in the future than they are today. And the case for a transcendent causal agent will grow stronger and stronger as we learn more and more about the physics of the universe. And we would anticipate that evidence for other miraculous acts will be found. And what I want to emphasize here is that what we're confronted with is an undeniable miracle that has taken place. And it's the biggest we can imagine. I mean, if you were to ask me as a scientist, what's the biggest miracle have you ever seen uh, physically, I would have to say it's the creation of the universe out of that which we can't see or detect or measure. So this is the greatest of the scientific miracles that we've been able to document and prove. And the fact that we've been able to establish one miracle, uh, this great miracle, opens up the possibility that other miracles necessarily could have taken place, which means we can no longer do scientific research under the assumption that miracles never happen. We've been able to prove uh, in a very powerful way that at least one has taken place, 
and if one has happened, that opens up the possibility for others. And that therefore, we can't restrict science to being a discipline that only looks at strictly natural causes. A possibility for the supernatural has been proven uh, to be the case. Now, as much as the Bible says about the beginning of the universe, it actually says much more about the expansion of the universe. In the English translations, it usually comes out that God is stretching out the heavens. But the verb nata is actually better translated, the continuous expansion of the universe. Now, you won't find any of these statements in the book of Genesis, but once you get to Job and forward, you'll see six different Bible authors that speak explicitly about this continuous expansion of the universe. Job makes the point that there's something supernatural about this expansion. It says God alone is expanding the universe in a manner that would permit life to exist. Isaiah and Psalms makes the point that God is expanding the universe like one would stretch out a tent in order to live in it. And the interesting thing about that word picture is the reality of a tent is its surface. Uh, it's not the interior or the exterior, but the surface that makes up that tent. Well, likewise, astronomers now know that the reality of the universe is a surface with nothing interior or exterior. And if I were to give you an analogy, Think of planet Earth. Planet Earth is a three-dimensional body, but where do we human beings live? We live on the two-dimensional surface of the three-dimensional Earth. Likewise, astronomers have now demonstrated that all the stars and galaxies, all the matter and energy, is on the three-dimensional surface of the four-dimensional expanding universe ignoring for a moment the six tiny space dimensions that accompany the four large dimensions. Now, only since 1999 have we been able to prove that there's something special about this expansion universe. Now, the expanding universe concept has been around for, from a scientific perspective ever since Albert Einstein developed his equations of general relativity. If you solve those equations, it predicts an expanding universe. And in the 1920s and 1930s, astronomers here in Southern California made measurements in the galaxies that showed that the galaxies are moving away from one another in a manner that can only be explained by a continuously expanding universe. But in 1999, astronomers discovered that there were two physical factors that moderated or governed this continual expansion universe. Now, one was gravity, and that's easy to understand. Uh, you know, if there's two massive objects, the law of gravity tells us that they will attract one another. And the closer they are together, the more powerfully they will attract. And so with a continuous expanding universe, when the universe is young, it'll be small, the space surface will be small, the massive objects will be close together, and therefore gravity will be strong in its capacity to slow down the expansion of the universe. But as the universe gets older and older, and hence bigger and bigger, the bits and pieces of matter get stretched farther apart, and gravity becomes progressively weaker in its capacity to slow down the expansion of the universe. But in 1999, astronomers noted that for the first 8 billion years of its history, we observed the universe slowing down in its expansion, but for the last 6 billion years, it's speeding up. And that told them that there had to be this uh, property of the space surface of the universe that is now called dark energy. And dark energy has been called an anti-gravity term for the universe. That's really not correct. It's much more accurate to refer to it as an anti-elastic band. Now, I've got an elastic band here in front of me. Notice that it has the property that the more I stretch it, the more energy it gains to force contraction. The surface of the universe is the opposite. The more you stretch the surface of the universe, the more energy it gains to force forward even more rapid expansion of the universe. And you get the opposite effect of gravity. R namely, that when the universe is young, the surface is small, and therefore dark energy is weak in its capacity to stretch out the universe. But as the universe gets older and older, the surface gets bigger and bigger, and hence gains more and more energy to accelerate the expansion of the universe. Now, a number of years ago, uh, Lawrence Krauss, 
uh, chairman of the physics and astronomy department at Case Western Univer Reserve University, published this paper in the Astrophysical Journal, in which he stated, and this is a direct quote, that dark energy would involve the most extreme fine-tuning problem known in physics. And uh, he goes on in this paper to explain the nature of the problem. And it's not a difficult concept. If the universe expands too rapidly from the creation event, that will force the bits and pieces of matter away from one another at such high velocities that gravity will never have the strength to pull any of that matter into clumps to make galaxies, stars, and planets. And if the universe has no galaxies, stars, and planets, there will be no home in which life can possibly exist. On the other hand, if you expand the universe too slowly from the creation event, then gravity will e efficiently collect that matter, clump that matter into dense bodies. Uh, we're talking black holes and neutron stars. In other words, all the matter of the universe in a relatively short period of time uh, would be collected into these black holes and neutron stars. Now, the minimum density of a black hole or a neutron star is 5 billion tons per level teaspoonful. That density is so extreme, it will not permit the existence of atoms. It won't permit the existence of molecules. If there are no atoms and no molecules in the universe, there is no possibility uh, for life systems. So the universe must be expanded at just the right velocity, at just the right times throughout cosmic history in order to make possible planets and stars uh, which would enable life to exist. And what Lawrence Krauss points out in this paper, for that to be the case, it's necessary that this dark energy term be fine-tuned or designed to within one part in 10 to the 120th. Now that's 120 zeros after the one. If we were to compare that kind of fine-tuning design to the best example of human engineering design, we would discover that this dark energy design exceeds what we see in human engineering achievements by a factor of 10 to the 97 times, which would imply that this causal agent beyond matter, energy, space, and time at a minimum is 10 to the 97 times more intelligent and more knowledgeable than Caltech and MIT physicists who are responsible for the best example we can examine for human engineering design, and at least that many times better funded than those Caltech and MIT physicists. Now, what we're doing here is demonstrating that this causal agent is not simply a transcendent entity, but must be a personal being. The only way to explain this phenomenal fine-tuning design is that that design has been achieved by a being that is personal, intelligent, knowledgeable, creative, and very powerful. And we're actually able to measure, based on this minimum fine-tuning, that that creator must be orders and orders of magnitude more powerful and creative uh, than us human beings. And this led to, uh, a couple years ago, uh, the following paper, Disturbing Implications of a Cosmological Constant, to be published by three uh, non-theistic astrophysicists, uh, two from Stanford and one from MIT. And the cosmological constant is another term for this dark energy. So it's disturbing implications of dark energy. And I'm going to pull two quotes from the preprint of this paper. And the first is that arranging the universe as we think it is arranged would have required a miracle, a rather remarkable statement for three atheist astrophysicists to state in a research paper. And they followed it up with a second comment, an external agent, external to space and time, intervened in cosmic history for reasons of its own. Now, they found these two implications to be so utterly disturbing an external agent performing miracles for reasons of his own, that the last sentence of the research paper, they concluded the following, that the only reasonable conclusion is that we do not live in a world with a true cosmological constant. In other words, they were saying, dark energy must be wrong. Because if it's right, it implies that there must be this supernatural agent 
performing miracles for reasons of his own. And he said, we're not prepared to accept that. But the irony is that this preprint was posted on the Los Alamos website just weeks before astronomers came up with irrefutable evidence that this dark energy is real. Not only that it's real, but that it's a dominant component of the universe. Now, I'm not going to go into the details. This is covered uh, in our book, uh, Creation of Science, and you'll see it up on our reasons.org website. And uh, you can look at the details in the research papers. But there are now nine independent observational confirmations that dark energy is real and that dark energy makes up about 72 to 73 percent of all the stuff of the universe. So you've got measurements from galaxy cluster X-rays, uh, the cosmic background map done with the WMAP satellite, uh, also confirmed by ground-based measurements of the cosmic background radiation. That's the radiation left over from the cosmic creation event. Measurements of the expansion of the universe from type 1a supernova, uh, from gravitational lenses, uh, the distributions of radio galaxies, and then two deep surveys of galaxies, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the two-degree field survey, and then the velocity distributions of other galaxies. It's such that the astronomical community now recognizes dark energy is not going away. It's here to stay. It's the dominant component of the universe. And therefore, it really does appear that we're stuck with this causal agent beyond space and time, performing, performing miracles uh, for reasons that he has uh, chosen. Now, I focused on dark energy. However, Lawrence Krauss also made note of the fact that the mass of the universe must be carefully fine-tuned in order for light to be possible. The matter of the universe also governs this cosmic expansion. And what he notes is that if you look at this vast universe, and thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, we've now taken images so deep we can determine how many galaxies exist in the observable universe. And the answer is 200 billion galaxies, where each of those galaxies has on the average 200 billion stars. Now, I wasn't able to pick up the distant faint dwarf galaxies, but the bottom line is, we can conclude that the observable universe contains 50 billion trillion stars. And yet, the mass of the universe, the total mass of the universe, is so exquisitely fine-tuned that if we were to add a single dime's worth of matter to the total mass of the universe, add one dime to those 50 billion trillion stars, or subtract a dime from those 50 billion trillion stars, then life would be impossible anytime, anywhere in the universe. That's how delicately balanced uh, the mass of the universe must be. Add one dime, subtract one dime, and uh, you're not going to have life. Now, those are probably the two most spectacular evidences I can give you from physics and astronomy for the supernatural, superintelligent design of the universe uh, for the benefit of life. But there are many more. Uh, what I have here is a short list of several different features of physics, the laws of physics, and the, the gross features of the universe that must be exquisitely fine-tuned. All of the fundamental forces of physics, gravity, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, must be exquisitely fine-tuned for life to be possible anytime, anywhere. Not just life as we know it, but any kind of physical life. For example, the ratio of the electromagnetic force to the gravitational force must be fine-tuned to within one part in 10,000 trillion, 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 where there's no possibility for life anywhere, anytime. We already mentioned the expansion rate. The age of the universe must be exquisitely fine-tuned. The velocity of light. The universe must be extremely homogeneous and uniform for light to be possible, but not too uniform and not too homogeneous and then the entropy level uh, must be just right. And if you go to our reasons.org website, you'll see posted there a list of 93 different features of the laws of physics and the gross features of the universe that must be exquisitely fine-tuned to make life possible. And we would predict that as astronomers learn more about the universe, that list will grow. 
We've seen it grow from four factors for design uh, 40 years ago to 93, and we're confident that uh, that will continue as we go on into the future. But that's the universe as a whole. Now, when we look a little closer to home, we're able to make astronomical measurements with much more precision than we can the universe as a whole. And we do that, we discover what's called the heavenly body problem. Uh, namely, that not any old galaxy will do. It takes a very special kind of galaxy, so special that we're now concluding that the Milky Way galaxy indeed may be alone in having the correct physical features that would permit advanced life to exist. Likewise, not any old star in that galaxy will do. Uh, it must be a star with characteristics virtually identical uh, to our star, the Sun. And we look at the planets in our solar system. We recognize that they're all needed to make life possible here on planet Earth. Jupiter must be just right, Saturn must be just right, Uranus and Neptune, all of these bodies play a critical role in making life possible here on planet Earth. And probably the thing that needs to be most exquisitely fine-tuned of all uh, would be planet Earth. Here we see hundreds of different characteristics of the planet that must be exquisitely fine-tuned uh, to make even simple life possible, let alone advanced life. And even our moon. I mean, our planet Earth is blessed with a single gigantic moon. And the moon has many exquisite properties uh, that would make life possible here on planet Earth. Now, this is something that we've reviewed in some detail, uh, not only in the Crater and the Cosmos, that's our best-selling book, but in our uh, award-winning DVD, uh, Journey Toward uh, Creation, which is now available in uh, 12 languages. And what I want to do is show you a short video clip uh, from Journey Toward Creation where we look at the weakest of these five evidences for supernatural design. I would argue that the strongest evidences are for the galaxy, uh, our solar system, our star, uh, the Earth, and then uh, the, the moon would be the weakest of the set. But even the evidences for the moon are quite spectacular, as this short video clip uh, will show. Moon exploration enabled us to confirm that lunar rocks differ chemically from Earth rocks. Through study of lunar rocks' radioactive decay, researchers discovered that the Moon is in fact nearly a hundred million years younger than the Earth. In the 1990s, a theory explaining the Moon's existence gained wide acceptance in the scientific community. According to this theory, an object the size of Mars crashed into the newly forming Earth about four and a half billion years ago. Most of the object's mass was absorbed by the Earth, but this collision also sent up a huge cloud of dust and rocky fragments all around the Earth. In time, gravity pulled those fragments together into one solid body, the Moon. The Earth, meanwhile, lost its entire atmosphere, and a new, much thinner one began to form from gases released by Earth's crustal material. Such a collision may seem a disaster, but it proved just the opposite. It set in motion certain alterations to Earth's features that eventually made this planet a uniquely suitable site for life. The odds against a collision benefiting the eventual support of human life are staggering. The planet colliding with the Earth would need to be the right size, moving at the right velocity, striking at the right angle, made of the right materials, and occurring at the right time in the development of planet Earth. If any one of these factors were off by just a few percent, the Earth would be barren today. Unless that impact had occurred, Earth's atmosphere would be much heavier than it is, even heavier than that of our neighboring planet, Venus. Venus's thick carbon dioxide filled atmosphere would mean instant death for all possible life. The extra mass Earth gained from the collision, along with its atmospheric revision, meant that water could exist on Earth in all three states, ice, liquid, and vapor. 
Well, a couple of decades ago, if you'd asked me, what is it special about the moon that makes life possible on planet Earth? I would have told you that through Newton's laws of motion, we recognize that this unique circumstance of a small planet orbited by a close-in gigantic moon stabilizes the tilt of Earth's rotation axis. All the other planets in our solar system have rotation axes that flip up and back like this. But planet Earth remains stable, a critical feature for advanced life on planet Earth. And what this video clip demonstrates is that with new technology and new discoveries, we're able to examine the properties of the moon in more detail and discover much more fine-tuning design than what we knew about before. And this enables us to develop a test uh, for creation evolution models. And if it turns out that uh, no creator is the answer, supposing the atheists and agnostics are right, that there's no creator responsible uh, for any of these features, then we would anticipate that as astronomers learn more about the universe and the solar system, that the evidences for divine design would decrease in number and would decrease in potency. And the evidence that the God of the Bible is the designer of the universe for the benefit of humanity would get progressively weaker and weaker as we learn more and more about the universe and the solar system. But what if we're right, that there really is a creator, and it's the creator God of the Bible? Then we would anticipate that as we learn more and more about the physics of the universe, that the divine design evidences would increase in strength and number, and that evidence that Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible, is a designer of the universe and the solar system for the benefit of human life would get progressively stronger and stronger. Now, one of the things we document in creation and science is we give you a table that shows you how the evidence has been getting progressively stronger and stronger for the biblical explanation of creation. And you also see this posted on our reasons.org website. And just to give you a quick example, in May of 2002, our scientific team at Reasons to Believe had gone through the scientific literature and found in that published literature 202 different characteristics of the solar system that must be fine-tuned to make advanced life possible here on planet Earth. And accounting for dependency factors and the fact that the universe could conceivably contain as many as 10 uh, billion uh, trillion planets, the probability that you would find one body in the universe with the capacity to support advanced life, less than one chance in 10 to the 217. 217 zeros after the one. Now that was May of 2002. Let's jump forward 30 months, two and a half years, to November of 2004. Now, instead of just 202 characteristics in the scientific literature, we find 437. Astronomy is a discipline where the knowledge base doubles about every four years. So in two and a half years, we've been able to add to those 202 characteristics uh, 235 more. And in counting for dependency factors and the maximum number of planets that the universe could conceivably contain, the probability of finding one body anywhere in the observable universe with a capacity to support advanced life is now just one part in 10 to the 410. But if we compare this one part in 10 to the 410 with one part in 10 to the 217, what we note is that very conservatively, the evidence that the God of the Bible has shaped, has shaped and designed the solar system and our planet for the benefit of physical life advanced life in particular, gets a million times stronger every month. Which means we can tell the skeptics, if you're not convinced today, wait one month. In a month, I'm confident that the evidence will get approximately a million times stronger than it is today. And this is a story we've laid out in some detail in uh, our book, The Crater in the Cosmos, which talks about the latest scientific evidence for the transcendence of the Creator and his personal attributes in designing the universe for the benefit of the human life. But I want to transition now from the simple sciences to the slightly more complex sciences. I want to address the origin of life. And 
You know, often people, when we talk about creation evolution, they want to talk about the fossil record and all of its complexities, but really the simplest problem to deal with in the history of life on planet Earth is the beginning of life. And so this is a theme that uh, we took up in our book, uh, Origins of Life. And uh, what I want to address in just a couple of minutes here are three major paradoxes from a naturalistic perspective for the origin of life. There are many more than these three, but these are three that I think are simple to understand. You know, I had the privilege of taking a course at the graduate level from Carl Sagan. And in that course, he said, this is how life arises. We have this vast primordial soup here on planet Earth. And this primordial soup, this soup filled with prebiotic molecules, percolates for a billion years. And with all of these molecules in this vast soup, and that huge amount of time, then it's inevitable that through natural process, these molecules will assemble themselves into a simple life form from which we all evolve. That's the Carl Sagan story, or answer to the origin of life. However, that was 30 years ago. We now know a lot more about the history of the Earth than we knew back then. And we now recognize that instead of a billion years for the origin of life, it's much briefer than that. It's really just a geologic instant. And what we've been able to discover through the Apollo research program on the moon, where they brought back lunar rocks, and through detailed computer modeling of the asteroid belts in our solar system, is that 3.85 billion years ago, the entire inner solar system, including planet Earth, was pelted by gigantic comets and asteroids pelted to such a degree that the entire surface of planet Earth was turned into molten lava at least 200 kilometers deep and at least 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit in temperature. Now those conditions obviously would destroy any prebiotic molecules. And yet what we note is that just 50 million years later, we have chemical evidence for an abundance of life here on planet Earth. We get that evidence for looking at carbon-12 to carbon-13 ratio analysis. And it tells us that in Earth's oldest rocks, which date to 3.80 billion years ago, we find an abundance for the chemical signature, the carbon signature of living systems. Uh, namely, that uh, life prefers carbon-12. And so if you see a higher ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-13, that means that carbon has been processed by life and it's that kind of evidence that tells us life has been abundant on planet Earth as far back as 3.80 billion years ago. And the astronomers weigh in on this, and they look at this late heavy bombardment, which peaked 3.85 billion years ago, and they calculate it would take 50 million years for the planet to cool enough that rocks can form and liquid water uh, could begin to uh, precipitate out on the surface of the Earth. Well, you can do the math. Take 3.85 billion years, subtract 50 million years from it, what do you get? 3.80. And yet we have evidence that life has been abundant as far back as 3.80. Subtract 3.80 from 3.80, that gives you no time for the origin of life. And that same carbon-12 to carbon-13 analysis tells us that planet Earth, over its entire 4.5662 billion year history, has never had prebiotics. Prebiotics would have a higher ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12. All the carbonaceous material we see in the entire record, the geological record of the Earth, has a signature of being postbiotic, not prebiotic, which means planet Earth never had a primordial soup and the origin of life on planet Earth took place in a geologic instant. Well, there is no time for the origin of life, and there is no soup from which to assemble uh, that life, then that really does rule out a naturalistic explanation for the origin of life on planet Earth. Now, if you were to go to a chemist and say, well, let's just talk about these prebiotics. Let's just assume they exist in some way. What would be the first step, or the simplest step, and taking those prebiotic molecules and putting them together to make a living system. While requirement of living systems 
is that all the amino acids that make up the proteins and all the sugars that make up the backbone of the RNA and DNA molecules must be homochiral, which means they all must have the same orientation. Amino acids come in two types, left-handed oriented and right-hand oriented. Likewise, the nucleotide sugars have the same feature, a left-handed uh, configuration and a right-handed configuration. Now, life here on planet Earth, the amino acids are all left-handed and the nucleotide sugars are all right-handed. You say, what happens if you mix it up? Then the amino acids won't assemble and the nucleotides won't assemble and you won't have proteins, DNA, and RNA. Well, it was a number of years ago that the biochemist William Bonner made this comment after 25 years of trying to research the source of homochirality in planet Earth. And he concluded after 25 years of research that, quote, terrestrial explanations are impotent or non-viable. There's simply nowhere on the planet Earth, in the entire history of planet Earth, where there could be any chemical or physical mechanism that could explain how all amino acids that make up life could be put into a left-handed configuration and the sugars into a right-handed configuration. And what this did is it fostered a search to find the sources of homochirality in outer space. And indeed, what we astronomers note is that when you go into outer space, there are places where you get circularly polarized ultraviolet light that has the effect of destroying one of the handedness of the molecules and leaving the other handedness uh, less destroyed. And so it preferentially destroys, say, left-handed amino acids and preserves the right-handed, or it could do the reverse. The problem, however, is that it takes 100% circularly polarized ultraviolet light just to get 20% excess of one-handedness against the other. And for light to be possible, it must be 100%, not just 20%. Uh, moreover, when we look in the uh, universe, we only find two places where you can get this circularly polarized ultraviolet light, and that's in the immediate vicinity of black holes and neutron stars. But in no case do we see a place where there's 100% ultraviolet uh, circularly polarized light. And therefore, the best that we can simulate under laboratory conditions that model these black holes and neutron stars is that you would get an excess of 1.12%, which is woefully inadequate uh, to solve the homochiral uh, problem. Uh, moreover, it would all have, to be wave, uh, all have to be ultraviolet light at just a single wavelength, and no astrophysical source uh, has that. So we're left without any terrestrial source, and we're also left without any astronomical source in which we can possibly solve this homochirality problem. Now, this explains this new discipline of astrobiology. Uh, basically, origin of life researchers trying to explain the origin of life from a naturalistic perspective have given up on planet Earth. They say Earth is not a possible source. Life must have come to planet Earth from outer space. And we don't know how to solve the homochiral problem in outer space. We're simply not going to worry about it. That's what I find amazing. Here are these scientists have been working for 40, 50 years to solve the homochiral problem. They basically proved that it's impossible to solve from a naturalistic perspective. And so what happened? Research simply halted on trying to find a way around this problem. However, there is furious research going on on trying to see if they can find amino acids and uh, these nucleotide sugars in outer space. Now, the one location, and really the only location in astrophysics where there's any possibility for the chemistry that would make amino acids and these nucleobases are these dense interstellar gas clouds that exist throughout our galaxy and in other galaxies that we see around us. Uh, but there's a problem. Uh, these interstellar molecular clouds, even though they're filled with over 120 carbonaceous molecules of different types, we don't see any water there, and we don't see any ammonia. Without ammonia and without water, you're not going to have a chemical pathway uh, to make the sugars, the nucleobases, or the amino acids. And indeed, as astronomers have searched these interstellar molecular clouds in the attempt to find these amino acids, nucleobases, and sugars, they're coming up with absolutely nothing. Now, I say that because five years ago, there were papers published 
where certain astronomers claimed that they had found an extremely low abundance level of amino acids and one of the nucleobases. Uh, but in the last year in the Astrophysical Journal, both of those claims have been withdrawn as being mistaken identifications of the spectral lines. And so today it stands that uh, we have zero evidence for these building blocks of light existing anywhere uh, in the entire universe. Now, it wouldn't concern me if in the future they do find, say, amino acids in these interstellar clouds at one part per billion or ten parts per billion. I think the chemistry in those systems might permit the production of amino acids at those extremely low levels. But of course, that's going to be no help uh, for the building of life systems. If the abundance level is below parts per million, there is no possibility uh, for a chemical pathway to pull these things into more complex structures. Well, again, this hasn't bothered the uh, origin of life researcher from the naturalistic perspective. They just say, well, let's just assume it happens somewhere in a galaxy far, far away. And now they've looked at the problem of, if we do presume that this life is out there, is there a way it could be moved through interstellar space and land here on planet Earth? And uh, Fred Hoyle and uh, Chandra Wickramasinghe speculated years ago that maybe bacteria could be embedded in dust particles and those dust particles transported by light pressure uh, to planet Earth. However, astronomers now know that as this dust travels through interstellar space, it's going to be exposed to X-ray radiation and ultraviolet radiation. And it takes only a short exposure time uh, before the bacteria embedded in those dust grains uh, will be completely destroyed by the X-rays and the ultraviolet radiation. That would equally apply to, say, uh, bits and pieces of DNA, RNA, and the proteins. They, too, would be broken down in a short period of time. And what do you mean by a short period of time? I'm talking hours, days, at most weeks. And yet the transport time to move these interstellar dust particles from another star system uh, to our solar system is in the millions of years minimum. And during that long transport time, it's guaranteed that the radiation in outer space uh, will destroy the molecules. And there's also the problem that as they enter the Earth's atmosphere, they'll be heated up as they go through the Earth's atmosphere. The dust will be heated up, and that too would destroy any life that would be there. Now, this is a problem that was recognized at the last two Origin of Life research conferences, and astronomers there said, well, dust isn't going to work. Uh, what we need to do is find some vehicle to protect this life. And the vehicle that they came up with was a gigantic rock, a rock with a minimum size of two meters in diameter. And if you've got a bacteria square in the middle of that two meter diameter rock, and if the rock is solid rather than being porous, there's a possibility it could be transported across interstellar space, get through the atmosphere, and uh, have that bacteria intact providing the rock breaks up as it hits the Earth and the bacteria is able to wiggle out. However, Jay Malosh, an astronomer back in 2001, published a paper where he calculated how many rocks planet Earth would receive over the course of the history of the universe. And what he determined was that planet Earth would receive one rock the size of my fist or bigger. Forget the two-meter rock. Let's just go as a small rock the size of my fist. He calculated that planet Earth would receive only one such rock every 10 to the 16 years from other star systems in our galaxy and other galaxies. Well, that's a million times longer than the entire age of the universe, which means that life can't get here through rocks. And I remember at one of the Origin of Life research conferences, one of the scientists getting up and out of sheer frustration, came to the discussion microphone and said, what we've done at this conference is we've ruled out the possibility of the origin of life on planet Earth, we've ruled it out on Mars, we've ruled it out on the satellites of Jupiter and on Saturn's moon Titan, in fact, the entire solar system, we've ruled it out in these interstellar gas clouds, we've ruled it out on these um, star systems, other planetary systems. He says, the only thing that is left is that aliens must have brought life here to planet Earth. And so he proposed, and by the way, he's not the first. Francis Crick 
uh, back in 1981, wrote a whole book where he said, we've ruled out all possibilities except the aliens bringing life here to planet Earth. This is called directed panspermia, where scientists speculate that intelligent aliens in a galaxy far, far away sent a spaceship to planet Earth with life on board, and that spaceship deposited life here on planet Earth at several points over the past 3.8 billion years. Uh, but this raises a question. How do you explain the origin of the aliens? If you can't explain the uh, origin of life here on planet Earth or anywhere else in the universe, how on Earth can you explain the origin of these aliens? And even if they were to exist, how could they possibly travel through interstellar space? It's not that easy to move a spaceship across interstellar distances, and this is a theme we took up in our book, Lights in the Sky and Little Green Men, that it's actually, you would actually violate the laws of physics in attempting to transport life across interstellar space. The distances are too great, and the exposure to radiation and debris that you've got to pass through is such that that life can't possibly survive. So what are we left with? Well, a number of atheists and agnostics acknowledge these problems and say the only explanation for the origin of life here on planet Earth are hidden laws of physics. And so they say there must be this fourth law of physics, and it's that fourth law of physics uh, that explains the origin of life on planet Earth, and that life suddenly appears uh, through the operation of this law of physics. However, this law of physics directly contradicts the second law of thermodynamics. And if that second law is contradicted, there's no possibility for physical life anywhere. And so the theme we brought up in our book, uh, Origins of Life, is that the only explanation is really the biblical explanation that it is an alien, but it's an alien beyond space and time, and an alien who purposely put life here on planet Earth and uh, supernaturally uh, planted that life here. Well, let me spend just a couple of minutes talking about the most complex aspect uh, of this creation-evolution debate, and that would be the evolution of man. Now, in this cartoon I have up here, you'll notice that you have uh, life uh, progressing from uh, that primitive bipedal primate uh, that's on your left and progressing to that advanced character on the right. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, by the way, choose whatever sports bias you want. You don't have to put a football player there. Feel free to put a hockey player and whatever else you want to put at the front end. Uh, but I show this because this is the most common evolutionary explanation, that human beings are here as a direct result of evolving naturally from more primitive uh, species of life. Well, there's a famous evolutionary biologist, Francisca Ayala, that several years ago uh, decided to critique the search for extraterrestrial intelligent life by calculating from optimistic Darwinian perspective what is the probability that you would start with bacteria? Bacteria are the simplest life forms you see here on planet Earth. They're the first life that uh, showed up on planet Earth 3.8 billion years ago. Start with bacteria, and let's calculate the probability under the assumption that these evolutionary mechanisms are extremely efficient, uh, that you'd wind up with human beings or their equivalent. And the point that Francisca Ayala was making is that naturalistic evolution can go any number of a random different directions. That doesn't necessarily have to proceed in a direction that would produce human beings or their equivalent. And he says, even if Darwinian evolution is extremely efficient, as efficient as anyone would imagine, the probability you'd wind up with human beings is less than one chance in 10 to the millionth power. However, Francisco Ayala neglected to factor in that planet Earth changes over the billions of years, as does the universe and the solar system. And if you take that into account, the probability is less than one chance in 10 to the 24 million. And you say, what does that probability look like? It's equivalent to the probability that you would win the California lottery three million consecutive times where you buy just one ticket each time which is a probability that is not distinguishable from winning the California lottery three million consecutive times where you don't buy any tickets at all. And so this puts a big damper on the human evolutionary idea from a naturalistic perspective. But let me just spend a minute on what the Bible says about the origins of humanity. Uh, it tells us that Adam and Eve were the last of God's creation miracles, 
and that Adam and Eve were the only spirit beings God created on planet Earth. Now, what we've done in our book of Who is Adam, and it's also in Creationist Science, is to calibrate the Genesis genealogies to come up with a date for when God created Adam and Eve. And that date is 50,000 years ago, give or take 20,000 years. And interestingly, that biblical creation date for the human species of 50,000 years ago is consistent with what we see as the cultural big bangs. Namely, that when we look at the bipedal primates that preceded human beings, we don't see any language use. We don't see jewelry, we don't see clothing, and we don't see advanced tools, art, or music. But as soon as human beings show up, we see this sudden explosion of clothing use, of tools uh, for that clothing use and other advanced tools, uh, jewelry, and it's such that the jewelry is far more numerous uh, than the tools. These are all markers for Homo sapiens sapiens uh, contrasted with the bipedal primates that preceded us. As we explain in Who is Adam and also in Creationist Science, we now have genetic tools for putting these human creation models to the test. Mitochondrial DNA traces what happens to the human species on the female side. And we're able to test whether or not the human species is descended from one woman or many women from one place or many locations. And the answer is we are descended from one woman, one place. Now the date that we gain uh, from this study places that first woman at 150,000 years ago. But that is assuming that no one in the human species experiences heteroplasmy or triplasmy, which means we either get two or three sets of this mitochondrial DNA rather than one set. And when you take that into account, you wind up with a date of 50,000 years ago. And indeed, 10% of the population experiences heteroplasmy, 1% triplasmy, and that gives you a date of 50,000 years. On the male side, we can use the Y chromosome, and this gives us a date of 42,000 to 56,000 years uh, for that first man, and again confirms we're descended from one man, one, one place. In fact, in the scientific literature, they refer to these new discoveries as confirming the uh, Garden of Eden hypothesis. They actually recognize uh, that these new discoveries are consistent what the Bible teaches about uh, human origins. And perhaps the most remarkable thing to come out of these DNA studies is that when we isolate stable populations, what we notice is that you consistently get a younger date, an er a later date for the first man than you do the first woman. And this is referred to in the scientific literature as the younger Adam paradox, how the first man seems to show up thousands of years later than the first woman. But this is exactly what you would predict from a biblical perspective, because the Bible tells us that the entire human race is descended from eight people that were on board Noah's Ark, four men and four women. But there's a big difference, according to the Bible, between the men and the women. The men are all blood-related to one man, Noah. It's Noah and his three sons. And therefore, from a biblical perspective, we would predict a Y chromosome DNA bottleneck, not at Adam, but rather at Noah. The entire male species uh, had, can trace back their Y chromosome, according to the Bible, to that single man, Noah. But the four women on board the ark are not blood-related. And therefore, we could easily have the mitochondrial DNA bottleneck going much earlier, uh, even all the way back to Eve herself. The point is only from a biblical perspective uh, would you predict that you would get an earlier uh, mitochondrial DNA date for the human species than the Y chromosome date. If you want to read more about this, uh, who is Adam is the best source. And, uh, but to summarize what we've been doing here uh, today is looking at the reasons to believe creation model and giving you some evidence, uh, which you'll see summarized in this book, that indeed the reasons to believe creation model offers a comprehensive explanation of the entire record of nature, not just the fossil record of life on planet Earth, but of the entire history of the universe, our Milky Way galaxy, the solar system, uh, the planet, uh, and the life history of planet Earth from the least advanced life 
to the most complex advanced life in the context of what the Bible teaches about that whole sequence of history uh, being uh, initiated and engineered by the creator God of the Bible. And the biggest complaint I hear about creation in the scientific community is that creation is not testable. Well, we show you in this book how our creation model can be put to the test, how it could be falsified by scientific discoveries. For example, if scientists were to prove that there's nothing unique about the human species in terms of their spirit attributes compared to other creatures of life, that would be catastrophic to a biblical creation model. Likewise, if we were to prove that the universe never had a beginning, or there was no beginning to space and time, or a causal agent beyond space and time, that would be catastrophic to our creation model. And we give you several other examples in the book. And then we focus on how the model is predictive. In fact, what we do in the book is we close with 90 predicted discoveries that scientists will make in the next few years that are distinct from the predictions made by the naturalists, the theistic evolutionists, and the young earth creationists. Those are three competing creation evolution models that we contrast with our reasons to believe a creation model. And uh, the appeal of the book Creation of Science is that there's really no need for all this hostility over creation evolution debates. What we need to do is develop detailed models to explain the record of nature and insist that those models make specific predictions of what scientists will discover in the future based on their explanation of the record of nature. And then we wait two or three years and see which side's predictions come true and which ones fail to come true. Now, I'm not trying to claim that we have a perfect model. You only have that if you've got total knowledge. However, uh, predictions are a way to determine which model is progressing in the direction of truth and which models are failing to progress uh, in the direction of truth. If you want to read more about it, uh, you can pick up uh, this book, uh, Creation of Science. Uh, and if you've got questions uh, after reading that book about science faith issues, our Reasons to Believe organization maintains a daily telephone hotline every day except Christmas. We invite people to call in uh, with their questions about creation, evolution, other science faith issues. And also every Tuesday, uh, we have a live webcast where we talk about how these latest scientific discoveries are giving us additional tests uh, of different creation evolution models. And we invite people to call in on the phone or they can write in with their emails every week, creation update, and uh, we archive every show uh, on our uh, website. And if you'd like to be put on a list uh, to get a free magazine where we talk about some of these latest scientific discoveries, uh, there's an 800 number, 482-7836, uh, uh, or you simply can get a hold of us uh, through reasons.org. And then finally, uh, we have a Reasons Institute where if you'd like to take uh, courses that are accredited at both the undergraduate and graduate level on these science faith issues, uh, we are, uh, welcome you to, to sign up for that capacity. Thank you.